If you have the word of the Lord in front of you today and you'd open it with me. To John chapter 10, the first 10 verses. John chapter 10, the first 10 verses. Glory, glory, glory to the name of the Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord in the house of God today. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. John chapter 10, the first 10 verses. I want to talk to us today on the topic, safe. There's a simple sermon title, safe. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. And the King James text today reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, <coughs> and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. John 10, 1 through 10. Father, once again, well, we come boldly before the throne of grace as children which have been adopted into the household of Zion. We stand today before you called the children of God, imperfect though we may be, sinful as we may be, and yet, O oh God, by reason of our faith, you look upon us, you see us as holy, you see us as sanctified, you see us as justified, and you've placed our name on the roll, so that resurrection morning when the trump of God sounds, we shall realize everything that you have planned for us. We will be perfected. We will be made holy. We will be made righteous. Oh my God. We shall be able to look upon you in your glory. Master, in the name of Jesus, how we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the messenger of God. Oh Lord, this old preacher has been at this for too long. I know, God, that without the anointing, I'm nothing but a loud mouth with a lot of words. And when the anointing of heaven touches these mere lips of clay, suddenly, Lord, today, a fit word, a proper word, a constructive word, a word of salvation and healing is able to come from these imperfect lips. Anoint, O oh God, Today the speaker anoint as well every hearer. Prepare our heart even now to receive 
from the Holy Ghost, the word of the Lord, that this word might accomplish in us that for which you have sent it. We ask it today in none other than Jesus. Jesus, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I had the opportunity this week in going up north to visit Claude. I had the opportunity to go into Connecticut, my home state, and visit with a dear cousin of mine, a girl that I love dearly, and her daughter, who of course would also be my cousin. And uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with them, and I love to spend time with them, and I don't get to spend, but every few years I might be able to spend a little bit of time with them, and Tommy Smith them, and they're just the sweetest, most precious ladies, I'm telling you. And uh, my cousin has been down the road, as so many of us have, of, uh, you know, the evangelical church route, and she's been burned, and she's been abused, and she's been mistreated, and she knows what the damage is that can be done to a sincere and yet misguided soul who buys into the message of guilt and condemnation and negativity that is preached in so many churches in America today and around the world. She's got a sister, my other cousin. Again, I love her to death, but I can't even stand to be connected to her on Facebook because the stuff she posts on her page is so insane and so full of self-doubt and fear and condemnation and guilt and my God, it is all negative, it is all terrible, and I don't know how in the world that girl can live day to day. She's not walking in victory, she's not walking by faith, no, she's under a constant cloud of guilt and condemnation and fear, and then she turns around and throws that garbage at other people as well. And my cousin told me, she said, I can't even be around my sister anymore. She said, I, she, it, it, I just can't be around that insanity and that foolishness. She said, one minute she'll be preaching at you and condemning you and criticizing you and calling you every name under the sun. And in the next breath, she's trying to tell you that she loves you. She said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, honey, I know. I'm going to tell you, anybody who's ever been raised in an abusive home, if you've ever experienced parents who are physically or psychologically abusive, I've been there, so I know what I'm talking about. If you ever had somebody in your family tell you in one breath, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, and then in the next breath, they look at you and say, I hate you, I wish you'd never been born. I've heard those words. I heard them more than once. And this person to this day does not understand for the life of them why they can say to me today, I love you, I love you, I love you, and it goes like water off a duck's back. Those words mean nothing to me anymore. They mean nothing to me. Why? Because one minute you tell me you love me, the next minute you tell me you hate me. So today you're telling me you love me, and all I anticipate is tomorrow you'll be telling me something different. You can't trust somebody who is inconsistent. You can't trust somebody who's sweet today and sour tomorrow. You can't trust a preacher. You can't trust a church. You can't trust a message that preaches the love of God one minute and the condemnation of God the next. Am I telling the truth? No. Honey, when people come up in church and all they hear one minute is, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. He only loves you enough to get you to the altar. Once you get to the altar, He's going to beat the crap out of you. Once you get to the altar and you become His child, God turns into an abusive parent. That's what most Pentecostal churches preach. I know I grew up in it. I know what I'm talking about. 
That's what most evangelical churches preach. I call it the great bait and switch. The message is all love and grace and sweetness and candy until they get you to the altar. And the minute you get in that altar, the minute you pray through, the minute you convert, all of a sudden now, there's a list of rules. There's a litany of regulations that you've got to follow. And if you don't follow every one of them, you're going to go to hell. If you don't do all these things that UBC tells you to do, you're going to go to hell. If you don't do all these things the Assemblies of God tells you you need to do, you're going to go to hell. If you don't change your sexual orientation, if you don't change this, if you don't do that, you're going to go to hell. Baloney, 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 baloney. Anybody who knows the truth about this great gospel knows that that is a false message. I'm here to tell you today, when you come into this great gospel, a declaration is made over you just like it's made at a baseball game as the runner runs from third base and he rounds third base and he heads for the home plate. And the ball is thrown somewhere from the outfield to the catcher at home plate. And the runner has no option but to slide in and hope that his foot touches that plate before the catcher catches the ball and tags him with it. And when the runner is able to beat that throw, you'll hear the umpire yell the word, Safe! Hallelujah! Safe! You scored! You did it! That run counts! Oh, hallelujah to God! Well, I'm here to tell you today, child of God, when you believe and obey this great gospel, the Holy Ghost from heaven yells out the word, Safe! Hallelujah! You are safe! Glory! And the message does not change at every provocation. The message does not change because you have weaknesses, because you have faults, because you have failings. Even if you have sin in your life, the message does not change. You're safe. God doesn't love you today and hate you tomorrow. God doesn't accept you and receive you today and condemn you and toss you away tomorrow. No, no, no. That's a false message. That's a false gospel. My cousin that I visited with in Connecticut, before we parted company uh, Friday, she, I give her a big hug and she said, hold on. She said, don't go anywhere. She said, I just want you to hold me a minute. And I just held her and we just stood there and hugged for at least maybe five minutes. Just not a word between us. Just hugged. She said, oh, Chuck, I wish I could go back to, I wish I could go back to Alabama with you. She said, because every time I'm around you, she said, I feel so safe. See, I'm not hate you today and love you tomorrow. I'm not judge you and criticize you and condemn you and yet try to tell you that I love you. No, my message is consistent. I do love you. You can have faults up the yin yang and I'm still going to love you. You don't have to be perfect and I'm still going to love you. Hallelujah. Isn't that what the Word of God teaches? See, my Bible said perfect love covers covers a multitude of sin. I love when these foolish people say, oh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Honey, if you're loving like God called you to love, you won't see their sin. Amen. You'll be focusing on your own. When you focus on what you need to focus on, you can't see other people's faults and failings. You can't see their sin because you're busy focusing on your own issues. And the only thing you're doing toward your neighbor, the only thing you're doing toward your fellow church member is what the Word of God said you ought to do, and that is to love them. Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, 
The word of God tells us, Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheepfold. Hallelujah. He said, if you come through me, listen to me, children, you're going to be safe. You're going to be okay. But you know, it's interesting because in his breakdown, in his explanation of, of this parable, he even said, you know, the sheep are going to listen to me now. He said, the sheep are going to be able to come and go. Because you can't always be in church. You can't always be in the house of God. You can't always be in quote unquote a safe place. But, he said, the shepherd leads his sheep. Hallelujah. He said, when the sheep go outside of the sheepfold, oh my God. He said, the shepherd's right in front of them. Glory to God. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. I want to tell you something, honey. Even when you're out in the world, even when you're at work, even when you're at school, even when you're in the hospital, even when you're serving in the armed forces, even when you are nowhere near the house of God, you're still safe. Glory to God. Because like the old gospel hymn, says he leadeth me oh blessed thought Hallelujah! he is leading you he stands before you he is watching out for you the shepherd's job is to keep you safe and I'm here to tell you the shepherd of your soul knows his job and he knows how to do it and he knows how to do it well and there is not a threat from hell or a trouble in this world that can prevent him from keeping you safe. Oh, I wish to God believers would understand this truth. I wish they'd let the Holy Ghost from heaven wrap his arms around them and just envelop them and allow them to feel safe. You have nothing to fear from me. There is no threat in me. There may be others who call themselves Christians who are going to curse you today and say they love you tomorrow, but that's not me. Hallelujah. Well, guess what? Jesus is the same way. He's not going to love you today and curse you tomorrow. Oh, hallelujah. My God, have mercy. Listen to me. In Ezekiel 34, 1 through 15, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, listen, against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. You see, he's rebuking the shepherds and he's telling them all the evil and all the misconduct they've engaged in. And then he says, and they're scattered because there is no shepherd. Well, wait a minute, you're rebuking the shepherds. Yeah, but they're not doing their job. And when you're not doing your job, you're not a shepherd. If you're not acting like a shepherd, you may be in a shepherd's position, but you're not a shepherd. You may be a, in a position in the local church as a pastor, but honey, you ain't no pastor. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Because a pastor knows how to heal the sick. A pastor knows how to bound, bind up the broken. A pastor knows how to comfort those who are hurt. A pastor knows how to find those that are lost and how to restore those that have been driven away. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? 
said, and they were scattered, verse 5, Ezekiel 34. Because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Notice the Lord's rebuke of the shepherds, not the sheep. Oh my goodness. <laughs> As I live, saith the Lord God, Surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries, and I then will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lay down, saith the Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord made a promise. He said, you know what? The shepherds aren't doing the job. A shepherd's supposed to represent the owner of the sheep. The shepherd's supposed to treat those sheep as though they are his own. But instead, they are capitalizing on everything those sheep can give them. They're capitalizing on the wool. They're capitalizing on the mutton. They're wearing the clothes and they're eating the food that those sheep provide. But they are not doing that which is necessary to allow the sheep to succeed and the sheep to prosper and the sheep to do well. So the Lord said, that's okay. Listen, he said, I will come. I will come. I will come. Oh, He didn't say, I'm going to send a shepherd. Glory to God. He said, I'm going to come and I'm going to search for him and I'm going to seek him out myself. Hallelujah. Oh, I remember Jesus saying one day, he looked about and said, I have come to search and to seek out that which was lost. Oh, hallelujah. He said, I the good shepherd glory to God honey I've got news for you the good shepherd is none but the Lord God himself and Jesus declared I am the good shepherd hallelujah because he promised he said I will come myself I'm going to do what the shepherds didn't do and in verse number 15 he said I I will feed my flock. He said, I'll gather them together 
on the mountains of Israel. You ever heard of a famous sermon Jesus preached called the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> that was Jehovah God gathering the sheep on the mountain, hallelujah, and feeding them just like he promised he would. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. I want to tell you something, folks. A lot of preachers get up and they don't do the job they ought to do. They're so busy preaching fear and condemnation and guilt and politics and culture wars and all kinds of other foolishness. They're so busy preaching everything they shouldn't be preaching because none of that crap is beneficial to the believer. None of that helps the child of God to live a better life. None of that helps the child of God to be prosperous, listen to me, in their soul. None of that helps them to be the best they can be spiritually. And yet that is their job. And I want to tell you today, they love to get up there and make the sheep think that God is out for them, that God is after them, that God is pounding them and plastering them and abusing them when the truth of the matter is, my friend, it's the shepherd God has a problem with, not the sheep. Tell you a little secret as long as the shepherds do right. All right. As long as the shepherd does right, guess what? The sheep are going to do right. As long as the shepherd's leading the people where they ought to be led, then there'll be no problem. Let me tell you, every preacher that gets up and preaches his congregation into hell is admitting he don't know how to preach. Every preacher that gets up and preaches guilt and condemnation and negativity and foolishness, all they're doing is confessing their weaknesses and leadership. Because if the shepherd was doing his job right, he wouldn't have to say a word about none of that. Oh my Lord, have mercy. You know, Brother Gillum told me many years ago, I'll never forget, he gave me so much advice and counsel when it come to ministry that to this day I, I live by and I try real hard to uh, utilize the advice that he gave me so many years ago. But Brother Gillum told me once, he said, you know, Chuck, he said the best way, best way to lead God's people if you want them to do right and act right and be right, he said the best way to do it, he said, is by example. He said, there's a lot of stuff you don't need to preach. Brother Gillum was holiness. Brother Gillum believed in high hair and long sleeves. But you know what? You never heard him preach it. Mm -mm. He never got in the pulpit and preached long hair. He never got in the pulpit and preached... Uh, not wearing jewelry, not wearing makeup and all the rules and regulations of the holiness faith and there are some people listening to me now and oh your righteous indignation I call it your stupidity but you call it your righteous indignation is getting all worked up well bless God he should have no he shouldn't have honey he didn't preach it he didn't have to he lived it and guess what his church looked like when the church of God was getting quote unquote worldly, when the church of God was modernizing, when the church of God was moving further and further away from the old time way, Brother Gillum had one of the only churches in the church of God that still looked like old time holiness. And boy, I'm going to tell you something. They had a move of God in that church like most churches today would only wish they could see, never mind experience. They had a move of the Holy Ghost in that church. You know why? Because he didn't preach all the things that shouldn't be preached. He preached the things that should be preached. Everything he preached was to encourage God's people to draw closer to the Lord. Everything he preached was to encourage God's people to uh, walk in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he preached was... God loves you and He is rooting for you and He wants you to succeed. Oh my Lord, have mercy. 
And yet he had a hole in his church. And honey, they used to shout the rafters down. The Holy Ghost used to come down in that building like nothing I've seen since. Except in a couple churches I've pastored, to be honest with you. Because that anointing is still in the world, honey. It's still there for anybody that wants it. And I'm going to tell you something. This preacher wants it. Hallelujah. I, will, I don't never want to be part of some dead, old, dry, spiritless church. God help me. I don't have time for that foolishness. In Isaiah 56, 8 through 12, the word of the Lord said, The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him, beside those that are gathered unto him. All the beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drink and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. He said the shepherds and the watchmen are partying. They're living high on the hog. They're getting rich because all they care about is what they can get. Honey, I'm here to tell you today, the church today has become what Israel was then. History is repeating itself. In Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 6, the word of the Lord declares, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking saith the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying, they'll be safe. Hallelujah. They'll be safe. Verse 5, Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days... Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Hallelujah. Oh, I've preached it so many times. I know I don't need to re-preach a, a small segment of a previous sermon. I've talked about it so many times. When we believe and obey the gospel, we put on Christ. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Hallelujah. He becomes the Lord, our righteousness. Hallelujah. He becomes our righteousness. He is a righteous covering. When God looks at us, all he sees is righteousness. Glory to God. Because of our faith, in believing and obeying this gospel. Oh, honey, I'm here to tell you, as a child of God, you're safe. There's no need to worry. In our, in our uh, statement of purpose, 
that Tommy read to you at the beginning of our service today. There's a line in there that says, if you've entered this church today having been wounded or offended by others who call themselves Christians, please know for a fact that here you are welcomed, loved, accepted, affirmed, and safe. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, that's a marvelous thing to be able to know that we are safe in our God. Hallelujah. Oh my God. In Jeremiah 25 verses 32 to 38. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Behold evil shall go forth from nation to nation. And a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Listen, verse 34. Howl, ye shepherds, and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherd shall have no way to flee, nor the principle of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and a howling of the principle of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord hath spoiled their pasture, and the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his covert as the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament prophets you hear God speaking condemnation and judgment upon the leadership. You hear Him speaking judgment. You know, He's not condemning the sheep. He's not condemning the people. No, no, no. He's talking to the leaders. He's talking to those that He has called to do a work and He has called them to keep His sheep safe. But they have done everything but. Well, I want to tell you something today, believer. If you're in a church and the shepherd is not keeping you safe and you don't feel safe and you don't feel like you're secure in your walk with God and you're secure in your salvation, then I've got news for you. They're preaching a false message. They're not telling you the truth. Amen. In John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14, Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep, excuse me, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring, hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of my children. I got news for you. Throughout the entire Old Testament, the people of God are said to be God's sheep. Hello now. Throughout the entire Old Testament, Jehovah declares he's the shepherd of the sheep. He declares he's the chief shepherd. He declares he's the one that's in ownership of the sheep. All of a sudden, Jesus appears in the New Testament and says, I know my sheep. They're my sheep. Those are my sheep. That there's mine. I'm the good shepherd. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Oh, come on, people. Wake up. Think. Use your brain for something more than a filler. Put two and two together. 
Jesus is Jehovah God. Hallelujah. He came to fulfill the promise I read to you earlier. Glory to God. That God himself, Ezekiel 34, that God himself would come and he would seek and save his sheep that had been scattered. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Listen to me. In Mark chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, now the Lord just said that He is the good shepherd. It's interesting that He didn't say, I'm the shepherd. He said, no, He said, I am the good shepherd. Well, why in particular would He use the word good? Why wouldn't He say, I'm the great shepherd, I'm the chief shepherd? Why did he say, I'm the good shepherd? Because listen, in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus saith unto him, listen, this is interesting. See, this is why the Word of God said, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You've got to put it together, folks. It's not hard. It's interesting. The Lord didn't just answer his question. No, no, no. He had another issue he addresses first. And he says to the man, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Oh, hallelujah. I am the good shepherd. There's not one that's good but God. Hallelujah. I am the good shepherd. There is not one that's good but God. Oh, hallelujah. Two plus two equals four. He came to do exactly what he said he would do through Ezekiel the prophet. That he would shepherd his own sheep. That he would do a work of restoration. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That is the exact language he used in Ezekiel 34. The exact language that God himself would come and he would seek out and save that which was lost. See, a lot of people, we read these words in the New Testament. And we don't put that together. We don't realize, wait a minute, these are the identical words that God used in Ezekiel 34 when He said He would come and do this exact thing. Hello now. Pastor, why does it matter who Jesus is? Why does it matter we understand He's God? Because, honey, there's a lot of people trying to tell you God is one thing and Jesus is another. God is one person and Jesus is another. And in dividing the, the, into two people, as it were, they're able to make God look very different than Jesus. All of a sudden, God can be mean. God can be judgmental. God can be critical. God can be hateful. God can be malicious. Oh, Jesus is wonderful. But He has to intercede for us because God can be a real mean. Am I telling the truth? I'm here to tell you, you're safe today because God and Christ are one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, honey, I've got news for you. Don't you fear for one minute that our Father is anything or anyone or any in any way different than the Lord Jesus Christ. No, they are one and the same. The same loving, compassionate, welcoming, affirming Savior that we read about in the four Gospels is the same God you'll stand before one day in the judgment. Oh, hallelujah. We shall all one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Understand today, my friend, that the Lord God Himself has come from heaven to do what men were not doing on His behalf, caring for the sheep and keeping them safe. As children of God, we ought to have a very different view 
and a very different understanding of our, re our relationship with the Lord. We're under the dispensation of grace. David, the psalmist, was under the dispensation of the law. And yet even under the dispensation of the law, David had a better view of God than many today who are under grace do. Psalm 23, we know it, we hear it at funerals, we hear this often quoted. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah God is my shepherd. I shall not want, meaning I'll lack nothing. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Remember what I said? See, the shepherd don't ever leave the sheep alone. We are safe because he is ever leading us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to God. Amen. O oh, child of God, today you're in good hands. The Lord Himself has come to gather, to heal, to restore. He has not come to destroy the sheep, but rather to execute judgment upon the shepherds and pastors who have refused to do the work that He called them to do with compassion and sincerity. And I've got news for you today, friend. Don't you think for one minute that that preacher who hurt you, don't you think for one minute that that pastor who dispersed you, don't you think for one minute that that principal, meaning uh, those in the church, you know, who are important and in charge, as it were, uh, that have done you wrong and mistreated you and abused you, don't you think for one minute they're not going to answer to God for that? Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Know this today. The God of our salvation is the Lord our righteousness. Hallelujah. You are not today to be fearful. You're not today to be condemned. You're not today to be criticized. But rather today this pastor has come to let you know you are safe. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord.